This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, hello, I'm Susan Brown. I lead the apple breeding program at Cornell University. I'm the Herman M. Cohen Professor of uh, Agriculture and Life Sciences. I've been here since 1985, have released a number of cherries, a tart cherry, and several apples. And I'm standing next to two of my babies, which are Snapdragon and Ruby Frost. They were grown exclusively in New York State by our growers, but now have been opened up and are being trialed around the world. And as an apple breeder, nothing is better than seeing your apples in the grocery store or having people say they're my favorite apple. Okay. What I love about apples is that they are, they just want to be diverse. So when you're breeding wheat or corn or rice, you want a uniform stand. You want not one, you know, uh, stalk higher than another, but apples are naturally outcrossing, which means genetically they have to produce and get pollinated by something that's not genetically related. That's exciting, but it makes for a lot of variation. That's how they've survived for millions of years. What we do is every time we find a really unusual plant, we spade it and we bring it to this place. And growers from other countries have said, I'm either crazy or a genius, and I haven't wanted it to go to a vote, <laughs> but I think you'll find some things that are interesting. Okay, as I said, there's tremendous diversity in apples. This is Malus domestica, the commercial apple, but I wanna give you a snapshot of what other diversity there exists with other Malus species, things that you never thought you would see within an apple tree. I am not a master of bonsai, these are genetically dwarfed trees that are at least 12 to 14 years old. Their sister seedlings are 25, 30 feet tall. This is on their own roots. And most breeders throw these away, but they're linked to genes of importance. And the more we understand about that linkage, the more we can genetically improve. Okay. This is another architectural type, type called weeping. Um, it was mapped uh, with collaboration with Kanang Zhu and his group to uh, linkage group 13. And as you can see, it cascades over. For machine harvesting, some of these unique architectural types uh, will give us insight in how to breed the perfect tree for mechanical harvesting, home use, etc. This is a columnar mutation. And we call it columnar because it has reduced branching, although this has a lot of branches. And you can see that the, the leaf type is very big. This actually has white double flowers, is spectacular in bloom. And we are learning more about what causes branches to be upright versus uh, straight. And for the ornamental market, there's a lot of interest in this particular accession. Most apple trees want to grow upright, but these just want to grow horizontally. In, in Russia, breeders have been using this where they could grow the trees under the snow line and keep the trees hardy because of the snow cover. So this is a columnar that we crossed by a variety called, or a species called Malus demerii. And when my graduate student at the time was showing me pictures, he only had pictures of the mother tree in a greenhouse. So I said, why is that? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, look it up. After we had planted hundreds of these in the field, it's also called Formosa apple. So it's not native here, not adapted here. We took a chance and we planted some of these. We wanted the very serrated, beautiful leaves that are shiny. And we wanted to see if we could get columnar habit in these leaves. And this particular species is used for cosmetics, for skin enhancing, youth uh, <laughs> uh, promoting chemicals. And we were able to prove that in one generation we could get something that would survive upstate winters. And so it shows for climate change, we're not as limited as, as we thought we would be. Okay, would you guess that that's an apple tree? So with the leaves that I've shown you earlier, would you believe that this is an apple tree or a giant rosemary plant that we decided to grow? This is a very unique plant in that it contains compounds that are very beneficial for diabetes control and are being actually used for diabetes treatment. Um, most red leafed material is like this. It's red at the tip and then it fades. And we weren't quite sure 
why that was. Oh, sorry, and then I'll then walk this way. <laughs> but now we have not only red coloration that's staying, but interesting lobed leaves. The blossoms of this are red. Some of them are single, some of them are double. Um, but we feel that it's an important niche in the uh, ornamental market. This is when you do your happy dance. I've never seen a, a crab apple like this in terms of intensity of color, the uh, lobed leaves, the fact that it's almost maroon. And then for ornamentals, you want the fruit to be very small and not create a tripping hazard, but provide some food for wildlife. So this is the absolute perfect specimen. Terras, um, and this is an example of why do we care about what is in setters of origin? This is derived from something called Malus nudzwitzkiana. It's related to one of the first apples that ever existed. And this characteristic red color um, is only found in nudzwitzkiana and its derivatives. And recently, other breeders are looking to produce red-fleshed apples for not only eating, obviously much larger than this, but also for rosé cider. And there's a lot of very healthy compounds, but there's some astringency and acidity that has not made it my priority in breeding. But the other variability is that almost every apple cluster sets five or six flowers. And in the center of the flower is called the king. And just like in life, it's good to be king. So you want, it's the biggest fruit, it's the best fruit. Now naturally, all these apples would be set and an apple always produces more blossoms and more flowers uh, to produce fruit than they can handle. This year, because of drought and a number of frosts, instead of seeing fruit covering this tree, you're seeing an apple here or there. And that's kind of a disastrous for our growers. It's gonna mean these apples are amazing. So they're gonna be very big, they're gonna be delicious, but there's not gonna be enough of them. So those are some of the challenges that we face. Other challenges are things like powdery mildew. Give it its name because it looks like somebody sprinkled powdery, uh, powdered sugar on the, the tip. And so these are all the things as a breeder I have to consider, but what I consider first and foremost in my program is consistency of quality. And so we know that if you get a banana, you want that banana to taste the same if you could catch it at that perfect stage of ripeness. Um, with apples, we wanna make sure that they're consistent. But a tree, as you can see, is very variable. You'll have different branches. We're trying to farm the sun and by doing that, we want to make sure that the apples on top that are getting a lot of sun are as, uh, as good, or these are as uh, good or better um, when they're in the shade. As you can see that an apple is sensitive to sun. The color is going to be where the sun hits it. Where the sun doesn't hit it is where it's going to be green, or where a leaf covers it, or um, where uh, something else covers it. When I started this job, I asked growers, kids, my family, what do you like about an apple? What do you want to change? And the growers were like, watch out for the stem. It's like, what? What do you mean watch out for the stem? Well, so this is a nice long stem. If it's too short, it pushes off the tree. If it's too long, it can swing and hit. But if it's with another apple in the, in the bin, that stem, serves as a puncture point. So things that you never even think about, the bottom of the apple, pink lady has a very open calyx and fungus can get through. So what I love about my job is whether it's climate change or in, uh, increasing vitamin C or uh, compounds related to diabetes control, um, we get to learn something and every piece of information that we have, so we have a published genome we have a lot of molecular markers. We have a lot of people working on many of the same things. But the more we know, the more there is to discover. And if you're a, a picture puzzle junkie as my family are, um, just as you think you have the puzzle piece you want, it doesn't quite fit. 
and we have to figure out a way around it by collaboration. And so I'm fortunate that we've had varieties that have been very well accepted, but we also have some things that I think are gonna blow the minds of the next generation. So you and the audience are gonna have ideas about, okay, what does this mean? What, if we see this particular phenotype, what does that mean genetically? And why should we care? And if you want to get funding as a graduate student or as a, a new researcher, if you can't explain to people why they should care, you're not gonna get that funding. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.